Good morning. We've been uh, enjoying our time together already here this morning with the worship team. And we're just so glad to have this chance to be back together. I'm glad to be back. So, welcome to Pine Grove Baptist Church as we worship the Lord together this morning. Uh, very grateful to be back with you guys. My wife Julia and I were gone for a couple of weeks as we returned our youngest daughter to college in the northern part of the state and then uh, took a lazy trip home via a little frame. We had a, a relaxing time, and uh, I just want to express my thanks and gratitude to Pastor McLean for filling in those couple of weeks, and to our worship team for leading you all in worship these last couple of weeks, but we are glad to be back and to be with you. Uh, before we get any further, I want to highlight one thing, and that is that our growth group ministry is starting up again this week. So... Uh, one, you will find in the comments section on the live stream, if you're watching that, or uh, in the description of the sermon on our website, you will find a link that will take you to uh, the download of the study guide for this week that, that coordinates with the message that will be uh, in today, the part of Scripture will be in today. So grab a hold of that, take some time to work through it, and our growth groups will be on Tuesday night and Thursday night coming up this week, 7 p.m., both nights. Uh, if you're part of our church family, you should have received an email earlier this week with a link to sign up. If you haven't done that, please take the time to do that today. It helps us to know who to, to make sure we get the proper links to to join us. We're going to be starting those online, and Lord willing, as things open up and change, we hope to be back in homes together real soon. But we're looking forward to trying to, to get those times of, of fellowship and intimacy and prayer together started. So that's starting this week. Let's take a moment and pray together, and then we'll jump right into worshiping the Lord in song. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your presence, your grace, your mercy, your provision in our lives. There's so much going on in the world around us and, and even in our own homes and at work, and yet, God, it is so reassuring to know that not only are you aware of it all, you're there with us through it all. And God, our desire is to exalt you this morning, to praise you, to lift you up and proclaim that you are great and you deserve our honor and our praise. We thank you for your presence with us and ask, Lord, that you would lead us not only in our, our songs of worship, but that you would lead us in our study of your word. May all of these things be to your glory and honor, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, we have some wonderful worship to sing together this morning. A little bit of uh, well, especially if you're watching from home, nobody's going to know. There's a little bit of toe tapping or, or foot stomping or even clapping. You are welcome to do that in the, well, you could do it in the privacy of your own home. Or you can do it with other people if you feel comfortable. But let's go ahead and lift our voices together. All set? Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us. Like wildfire in our very souls, Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are the church. We need your power in us. We seek your kingdom first. We hunger and. 
God is glorious. He is building His kingdom right here among His people. It is something that is not so much a physical thing like a building as it is the people of God that He draws together from throughout this world. We have a single foundation that is faith in and upon Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's continue to praise Him. conclude our time of worship and song by just inviting the Lord's presence. Oh, 
Again, it's uh, very good to be back after two weeks away, and I thank you for your prayers for my family and I as we traveled and uh, made our way through these past couple of weeks here. I encourage you to keep praying as well for uh, the rest of our church family and others that you know. Uh, hopefully, again, if you're a part of the church, you should have received our, our prayer sheet that goes out each week to just let you know how you can be praying more particularly for folks in our own church family. But of course, our prayers are not limited to that at all. Be praying for others around you. Pray for your neighbors. Pray for your co-workers. Pray for our, our local and national leaders. Pray for uh, the coronavirus and, and the fires and all of these things we can be bringing to the Lord in prayer and to know that He hears us and, and He desires to respond. And, and uh, again, it, we're starting up our growth groups. I want to put one more plug in for that. Our growth groups are just a time for us to gather in smaller groups to encourage one another, to share in times of friendship and fellowship, to, to study God's Word a little bit more together and, and to pray together. So I encourage you to, to make a point of joining us for those this coming week, Tuesday night, Thursday night, 7 p.m. online. If you did not get an email with the link or you, you lost it or you need access to it, uh, call or email the church office. You can find that information on our website, which is linked in the video, but call us and, or email us and we will get you that information so that you can join us. Well, let's pray once again before we dive into our study of God's Word together this morning. Again, God, we just are so grateful to be here. We're so thankful that you are with us and Lord, we look forward to what you have for us, what you will to, uh, teach us, Lord, and, and encourage us in through your word. Help us, Lord, not to just hear it, not even to just understand it, but to seek how your word applies to our lives today. Your word, the Bible, it is relevant. It is living and active, and it has every application to our daily lives right here, right now, today. And we seek to live in such a way that, again, it brings you that glory and honor which you alone are worthy of. And we ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, so uh, again, our, our trip took us up north. We went all the way pretty much up to the northern edge of the state to drop off our youngest daughter all the way up in Shasta County and, uh, and then again back through Monterey, spent a couple of days there. And you know, uh, from, from north to mid to south and, and everywhere in between, you know what it was? It was smoky. <laughs> everywhere we went, it was Smoky, which no small wonder, I suppose, with uh, I think at last count, what was it, 3.5 million acres of California on fire right now, literally tens of thousands of personnel assigned to multiple fires that are burning within the state. Uh, this has been one of the most unprecedented fire seasons in recent history. Uh, you've probably kept tabs on a number of the fires that are, are burning all around the state. Uh, one we've been kind of watching is the Creek Fire, which is in the, the low Sierras in Fresno and Madera counties. Our, uh, our middle daughter is out in Fresno, and 
uh, working at Fresno State University where she was taking in uh, animals, horses particularly, from residents that were coming off the hillside because of the danger of the fire. That particular fire has burned nearly 300,000 acres in just a short two weeks. There are almost 3,000 firefighters assigned to that one fire alone, working to contain it and ultimately extinguish it. And I think at last count, they were still only at about 25% containment. You know, it takes a lot of teamwork for things like that. To put out a forest fire, unless you're just going to let it burn until it decides to stop, it takes teamwork. It takes coordination. Not even just the coordination of where do we cut fire lines, where do we drop FOS check, where do we deploy crews. Do you realize with 3,000 firefighters on that one fire, they all have to have a place that they can at least throw a sleeping bag down. They have to have restroom facilities when they are in camp. And somebody's got to feed 3,000 of those people a couple, three meals a day. There's a lot of coordination and teamwork that goes into attacking and managing disasters like these fires here in California. Not only does a unified approach then provide for better results, uh, i.e. get the fire put out, but it provides for safety. I'm sure you're aware, firefighters, they, they look out for one another. I mean, they're kind of that no man left behind kind of a crew. They, they don't leave one of their own behind. They, if somebody's down, they, they rally to that individual and help them. And uh, they have that, uh, I call it kind of the three musketeers mindset, you know, that uh, all for one and one for all kind of a mindset that we see in so many different groups. We, we see that same mindset, not just in firefighters. We see it certainly in our military. We see it in our law enforcement. We, we see that attitude showing up in, uh, in the heroes, in our movies, right? You know, the, the groups pull together to fight a common enemy. Uh, it's ingrained in our sports teams. Everybody's working together towards a common goal. We see it in relief organizations as they come together to try and meet a particular need. There's great value in that. There's so much value in everyone pulling together toward a common goal and supporting one another in the process. And I personally believe that nowhere should that be more evident than in God's church. That as Christians, as believers, as people, individuals who have put their faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, faith in Him for the forgiveness of the sins we've all committed, faith in Him for salvation and eternal life, that we should experience, we should strive for that same sort of teamwork, unity, to be together, pulling together, working towards a common goal, supporting one another in the process. This morning, we're going to be in John's Gospel, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John in your New Testament, and we are in chapter 17 this morning, finishing up just the last handful of verses of chapter 17. Throughout this chapter, Jesus has been praying. The whole of chapter 17 is one big long prayer that Jesus spoke out loud in the hearing of His disciples. And in this final portion of His prayer, these last half dozen or so verses, Jesus turns His attention to pray for everyone who would ultimately come to faith in Him. Everyone who would ultimately come to believe in Him. Not just his disciples, but the people who would believe what his disciples had to say in the years that followed, in the centuries that followed, in the millennia that followed. He prays for all who would believe in him throughout the ages. And, and guess what? That includes you, and that includes me, and that includes everyone who trusts in Jesus for their salvation. That's pretty amazing to think about, that in these verses, Jesus is praying for you directly. Jesus is praying for me. There's other passages in the Bible where we read about the fact that Jesus does pray for his followers. We see it in certain passages in Romans and in Hebrews and 1 John, that idea that, that he's constantly interceding on our behalf. He's constantly praying for us. And sometimes we read those kind of verses and we wonder, well, gosh, I wonder what Jesus is really praying for me. Is he praying that God would, 
you know, get my, help, help me to get my act together. Well, God, you know what? Convict him of that sin and make sure that he squirms until he stops doing that. Or is he praying that, oh, Lord, this one's weak. I hope you just give him enough strength to make it through. Well, here we have, in the end of John 17, we have Jesus' own words. This is one of his specific prayers for us, an actual prayer that he prayed for us. And do you know what was foremost on his mind as he was praying for you and me almost 2,000 years ago? Well, let me give you a hint. It wasn't that we would have knowledge, that we would come to fully understand every in and out of Scripture. He wasn't praying that we would have perseverance and, and make it through. He wasn't praying that we would have power and be able to kind of just dominate and bring the Word of God everywhere. You know what he prayed for? Unity. He prayed that his followers would be united, that we would stand together as the body of Christ. Jesus' greatest desire in this prayer that we're looking at this morning is that we as his followers, that all who name Jesus as their Savior, that we would experience unity. And he then goes on to pray for our presence with Him in heaven and that we would also display a godly love toward one another. So let's dig into what He prays for us. Again, we're in John chapter 17. Open your Bibles there if you haven't already. John chapter 17 and verse 20 is where we're picking up and we're going to finish out those last handful of verses here. So follow along as I read John 17, beginning in verse 20. Again, this is Jesus speaking. He's praying in the hearing of His disciples, and here's what He says in verse 20. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who would believe in Me through their word, that they may all be one, even as You, Father, are in Me and I in You, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that You sent Me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you. And these have known that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. I want to work us kind of backwards through this passage this morning, starting at the end and backing up toward the beginning so that we will spend the bulk of our time, we will finish up where Jesus kind of lays His priority, His primary focus. So let's jump to the final verse of John 17 here. In this last verse of the chapter, Jesus prays that we will love like God does. Essentially just saying, I, I want, Father, that these would love the way you do. Let them display a God-like love toward others. Now remember, at this point, we are literally just hours or less away from Jesus being arrested, tried, and crucified. This will all take place. He will be dead and buried in less than 24 hours from when He speaks these words. He spent the last three plus years with these disciples, leading them, teaching them, and in turn, these men would then pass along what they had received from Him. They would take Jesus' teaching and bring it to others, really to everyone after them. In fact, in a very real sense, everyone who is a Christian today, everyone who has come to that point in their life of recognizing that like all of us, they are a sinner, they've done wrong things, and that they need God's forgiveness, that they have come to Jesus by faith, believing 
in Him as the Son of God, believing in His life, death, and resurrection. All Christians today are Christians because of the disciples' ministry. Uh, They shared Jesus' message verbally in the years that would follow Jesus' death and resurrection. They went throughout that, that kind of Jewish world of the time and even well beyond bringing that message of God's love and offer of forgiveness and salvation. And then they're the ones who were responsible for writing the entire New Testament in your Bible. Under God's direction by His Holy Spirit, they wrote down the things God wanted them to pass along after they couldn't share it verbally with other people. And that's what we have in our hands. So today, we are believers because of the ministry that dates all the way back to those disciples. Jesus says that the world had not and and to date has not truly come to know God. The knowledge that they do have about God, I would say it's, it's faulty. Consider, where does the world, and by the world, I, I'm using kind of John's usage here as he does in his gospel. He defines the world as, as those who do not believe in God, those who do not believe in Jesus as the Son of God. So, everyone who is not a, a believer in Christ would be the world in John's mind. So, how does the world come to any kind of a knowledge about God? I think to be fair, in, in our contemporary 21st society, much of what people who uh, do not know God or, or do not know about God, what they have come to know about Him has probably come through media, uh, movies, TV shows, uh, on- online things, whatever it be. And sorry to say, although there's been a number of good Christian movies that have come out in recent years, largely in, in kind of the, the world's media, Christianity, God, the Bible are not well portrayed, let's say. Uh, Usually they are shown in connection with perversion, mental illness of some sort, child abuse, dishonesty. So what does the world see? They see what's presented to them. Uh, That must be what the church is like. That must be what Christians are like. I guess that's what God and the Bible are all about. I saw it in a movie. It has to be true, right? If it's not that, I suppose some draw their understanding by looking back and highlighting the serious failures of Christians throughout history. They look back at things like the Crusades and the Inquisition and and various genocides that were supposedly done in the name of God or in the name of the church. And they seem to imply that, well, see, God and the Bible, that prompted those injustices. It prompted those evil things in history. And the truth is, is that many of those things were done at the very least in ignorance or in outright disobedience to God's commands and God's will. And yet it was done by people claiming the name of God. So, no, as Jesus says, even in verse 25 there, the world has not known God. But of course, Jesus has known God. Why? Because He is God, because He is the Son of God, because He came from God and was born to a lowly mother and her husband and lived among humanity for those 30-some years. He did it right, and He still suffered and died a criminal's death. Jesus has known God because He is God. And He passed that knowledge on to His disciples, and His disciples then turned around and passed it on to others who believed in their Word. And Jesus passed this knowledge on with a very particular purpose. He indicates in verse 26 that the love which the Father has towards the Son, He said, well, that would be the same love Christians would have toward one another. It was part of what Jesus wanted to pass on, that love. As the Father has loved me, let them love with that same sort of love. So, that means that everyone who accepts Jesus as the Son of God 
loving Him, loving the Father, that we will experience the love that is only known between God the Father and God the Son. That same love that is experienced in the Godhead, in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that same love that exists within God is now shared with us, and we can have that same love towards God and towards one another. We are loved by God with the same love that He has for His Son. Don't ever forget that. God loves you, Christian, the same way He loves His own Son. And that's the love we're to have towards one another. So Jesus prays, let my followers, not just these disciples, but all who would believe their words, let them love like God does. Backing up a little further in our text, we see also that Jesus prays for our presence with Him in heaven. Look at verse 24. He says, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. If we were to look back earlier in what John had to write here, matter of fact, earlier even that same evening in John chapter 14, Jesus had already promised His disciples that eventually they would arrive at the place where He was going. He had let them know in no uncertain terms that He was going away. He had let them know in no uncertain terms that He would ultimately die in Jerusalem, and this was the night before that would happen. And they were concerned about that. This was their leader for the past three plus years. And what will we do if he's gone? He had sought to assure them, well, you can't come with me right now, but you will be with me. In the meantime, I will be with you by God's Spirit. But one day, you will be with me where I am going. Here at the end of John 17 in verse 24, what Jesus says is that he wants all of his followers there. Father, I desire that all of these whom you've given me the disciples, those who would believe in their word. I want them to join me. I want them to be where I am. Uh, More than that, I, I want them to see the glory you have given me. I want them to see me as I truly am. I want them to see me in my glory. The disciples had seen Jesus face to face for these last three, almost four years. They had spent constant time with Him, eating with Him, traveling with Him, sleeping together as a group as they made their way from north to south and east to west. They, they were in each other's presence constantly. They saw him scorned. They saw him hated and mistreated and unjustly accused on earth. Very shortly, they would see him condemned as a criminal, brutally executed and buried. But they had never seen the full splendor of heaven. They had never seen the full glory of Jesus, which He possessed as the Son of God the Father. Jesus wanted them and all who would believe after them to see Him in His true glory. There's a part of me that thinks that right here we see just a a touch of Jesus' humanity. Jesus was 100% God, and He was 100% human, which is a little tough for us to wrap our heads around because Jesus was the only 200% person in all of history, fully God, fully man. And I think we see just a, a touch of Jesus' humanity here. He wants His friends to be with Him and to see Him. I know there's some of you who have recently uh, been working on your homes. There, there's been some remodeling going on in our church family. Uh, some of you have remodeled, oh, what have I heard about recently? Kitchens and bathrooms, and people have been doing some painting and, and other sorts of repairs. There, there's people who have bought new homes recently or, or not too long back. What do we do after we do those things sometimes? We, we invite our friends over, right? Hey, come to, take a look at this. You know, come, come see the new home God has blessed me with. Come see how the bathroom came out. It, it just, oh, we, we worked so hard to, to make it 
beautiful and, and comfortable, and we're so happy, and I want to share it with you. Come check it out. I want you to see. So Jesus looked forward to the time when his friends, all who follow him and believe in him, would come to be with him in his father's house and to see not only his father's house, which will be glorious, but to see him as he truly is, to see him in his glory. So Jesus prays here for us to join him in his eternal home. And with the remainder of our time this morning then, I want to focus on what Jesus has focused on primarily in this portion of his prayer. Jesus prays for unity in the church. It's got to be a big deal if Jesus takes the time to pray for it. He prays for unity in his church. Let's look again at those opening verses of our passage. And notice as I read how many times that concept of unity or oneness comes up in these opening verses. Beginning in verse 20, Jesus says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who would believe in me through their word. Now watch for it, that they may be one. Even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them, even as you have loved me. Again, Jesus prays for all Christians here, everyone who would believe in him for their salvation from the time of the disciples forward. And his chief prayer for us here is that we would experience unity. Now, we need to understand just a bit here what Jesus has in mind. First, we need to notice that his prayer is for unity, which is not the same thing as uniformity. Okay? There's a difference. He, he is praying for unity. Unity doesn't mean that we all do exactly the same thing. It doesn't mean that we are all identical copies of one another, that we think the exact same thoughts in every single area of our lives, that we would say the same things and do the same things, dress the same way, whatever else. It's not complete identicality, if that's a word. It's not uniformity. It's unity. Now, unity might involve uniformity. There are times when it certainly does, like synchronized swimming or or line dancing or something. Everybody's doing the same thing at the same time. They're doing it in unity, and they are doing it uniformly. So sometimes it does. But unity can also involve diversity, where everyone is working together for a common goal, but they all are doing it differently. They are all coming from different directions. They all have different approaches to things. Think of most team sports. There's different positions on the team. Now, that team is working together in unity to try and win or score or whatever it is that they are, offense or defense. They are working in unity, but everybody's doing something different. It would be the same thing with a construction project. Uh, different people, different skills, all working together to see that house or that building erected, but they all are doing different things, yet they're working in unity. Either way, you can see unity as these people work together. And so here in our passage, Jesus prays that we, believers in Christ, we, His church with a capital C, that we would experience unity with one another. Jesus' prayer links the unity of believers to our interior spiritual life. It's all who believe in Jesus as their Savior, all of us will be united by faith. That means that we are united with one another by virtue of that same common faith, because as we believe in Christ, as we believe in God, we are united with God, with Christ by faith. And if you are united with Christ by faith, and I am united with Christ by faith, then guess what? We are united to each other by faith in Christ. There is a unity that comes with being a believer in Jesus Christ. What that means is that 
Unity in the church is a present reality. It's not something that is a matter of external agreement. Unity is something that is true by virtue of our nature as Christians. We are united as a church because we mutually believe in Jesus as the Son of God and our Savior. It's true in the same way that it's true that all Christians possess the fruit of the Spirit that Paul talks about in Galatians. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All Christians have that because God has given it to them from that moment they put their faith in Jesus for salvation. And we say, whoa, wait a minute. I don't have a lot of patience. You know, I'm, I'm not always very self-controlled. Well, that may be. You have it. God has given it to you. Now, how, to what extent, greater or lesser, that you choose to exercise it, yeah, you're right. You may not be very patient. It's not because God hasn't given it to you. It's because you're not utilizing it. You're not taking, avail- uh, taking advantage of it. So, we actually do have those things. We actually do then also have unity. But we experience that unity to a greater or lesser extent based on kind of the degree to which we either work with or against God and His Holy Spirit. So, what are some ways we can try to allow the unity that God has provided to be more common, more prevalent in His church? How do we work our way towards greater displays of the unity that God has given us as a church? Well, we can pray for one another. We can seek ways to build one another up, encourage each other. We can work together on things in humility, seeking to give of our time and our resources to help where needs exist. We can come together as we do as a church to exalt and to praise Christ together. Those are all things that encourage the unity of God's church. I would say it helps to focus our attention on God. Look at His nature. Look at His attributes and abilities and holiness. The more we individually focus on that, the more we'll have kind of a similar mindset. We will experience that unity as a church. Uh, Keep things open and other things closed. Keep your mind, your, your heart, your ears open, and maybe keep your mouth closed a little longer so that you have a chance to process. You see, we need to realize that, as is true with everybody around the world, it's true in the church as well, that not all believers use the same words to describe things. We don't all talk the same way. And sometimes if we rush to a, a snap judgment, well, that person said that. Well, in my mind, I know what that means, so I'm going to judge them based on my interpretation of it. And sometimes we come to find out all too late, that wasn't what they meant at all. Uh, they, were, they were going a different direction with that entirely, and yet we can rush to judgment. Seek to understand what people mean, not just what they say. What we need to remember is that What did Jesus die for? Did He die for principles? Did He die for a a system? No, He died for people. Jesus died for you. He died for me. He died for every person walking the face of this planet that God might be able to offer them that opportunity to be forgiven. That's what Jesus died for. Another way for us to work towards greater unity in the church is to work against those things that create disunity in the church, right? Try and do the things that promote unity. Try to stop doing the things that create disunity. You know, we are so blessed, I think, in, in our day and age to have the internet, right? In this time, especially right now, with everything being so kind of constrained and shut down and you can't go as freely where you want to go and do as freely the things you want to do. Man, the internet's been a savior for a lot of people. School is being conducted online. Uh, you, can, you can join any number of these online meetings. We're meeting online as a church. Growth groups are going to be online. You know, you can connect with people even though you can't be in their presence. We can come together. So social media, that is such a wonderful way for us to remain connected with others in these kind of times. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, I don't know, whatever your flavor is, all of these things are useful tools. And I would say all of those things are morally neutral for the most part. 
That is to say that they can either be used for good things or they can be used for bad things. You can either put good stuff on them or you can put bad stuff on them. It's, it's not the tool so much as the person wielding it that really determines how it goes, right? Well, we need to be considerate about how we use tools like that. I find that too often I think our, 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 our posts, our pins, our texts, our tweets, uh, they're driven by emotion. Sometimes we just, we don't slow down enough to really think about it. We, we read something and, and it, it stirs something in us any number of ways. You know, it, it kind of puts fuel on that fire. It fans the flames and before you know it, you've got a conflagration that would rival any of the fires burning in California. And it can be positive or negative. It can be something that's, oh man, yeah, that's the way to say that. Boy, I totally agree with that. I'm going to quick repost that and blast it out to everybody. Or it can be the other side, right? I can't believe that person would say that. What kind of a moron are they? Oh, that just makes my blood boil. Oh, I'm so angry. And either way, it's just, man, those, those fires are burning. We just get so torqued and twisted up over those sorts of things. Whether it's, oh gosh, we've got no shortage right now, right? Politics, uh, masks, closures, what's allowed to open, what's not allowed to open, who gets to decide, you know, just... Just the stuff that's happening just right now, let alone everything else that's been on the internet forever, right? Well, we're called in Scripture to consider the needs of others ahead of our own. To consider them and their needs before we say, well, I need this. We're supposed to be mindful of our words, however they come out of us, whether they're spoken or, or typed. We need to be mindful of it. So, here's my suggestion. If we're going to, just in this one area, if we're going to work against disunity, let's think before we speak or text or whatever. Think before it comes out. And I'm using think as an acronym, T-H-I-N-K, all right? Let's start with T. T, is it true? Is it true? Uh, I know everything on the internet is true, right? No, it's not. Is it, is it true? Are, are you dealing with fact or, or is it just opinion? Uh, uh, H, is, is it helpful? Will this, what I have to say or, or this thing that I found that I really want other people to know that I agree with this, will it, will it help them? Will it benefit that person, those other people in some way? Is it I, is it inspiring? Will what I have to say, will what I have to share, will it, will it lift people up? Will, will, will it, you know, especially where it concerns, concerns my, my Christian brothers or sisters, especially where it concerns your, your family that is the church, will it encourage them in their walk with God? Well, let's get to end. Is it necessary? Does it really need to be said? I mean, it's, it's all over the internet already. Does it need to be said again? Or am I just, uh, I don't know, beating a dead horse, as it were? And finally, K, is it kind? Is, is what I'm about to post here or what I'm about to say, will it cause others to feel attacked? Will it put them on the defensive? Or will they feel cared for because of what I say? See, before we talk, before we text, before we type, before we tweet or post or pin or whatever you're preferred manner is. We need to think. Is it true, helpful, inspiring, necessary, and kind? If it's not, if it doesn't pass that five-point test, then I'd say it's better left unsaid. If I use that, I'd never say anything. I'd never text. I'd never tweet. I'd never post anything again. Great. You know, that might be a good thing. I'm not going to say it's a bad thing. I don't know. But we need to be mindful of it. Jesus prayed for us to experience unity with one another in the body of Christ. We have that. We have that by faith in Christ, but we can still work either to promote it or, or to hinder it. So let's, let's work to promote it and let's work against hinder, hindering it. All right, let me, get, let me get back to our text here. We were online far too long there. Uh, Jesus also prayed not only for unity in the church with one another. He prayed that we would experience unity with God, that we may be perfected, that we might be brought to full completion in unity. Look again at those verses 21 to 23. He's, he prays that they, that's all of us, that you and I, that we may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. 
The glory which you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them, you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. Jesus wants us to experience that unity with God. We have that, again, by faith in Jesus as the only one who can save us from our sins. We experience the closeness of that relationship with God, and as we pursue Him, His calling on our lives, His leading in Scripture, we experience that unity with God. That unity has a purpose, Jesus said in verses 21 and 23, that the world might believe, that the world might know that He was sent by God, that the world might finally get it. He's the Savior. He's the Son of God. He's the one that God sent to be our Savior. Jesus knew that there would be a diversity of people coming together to form this new church, this early church with the disciples. And, and, and look how it's grown after, over the last 2,000 years, right? People coming together in spite of their differences, in spite of their political opinions, in spite of, you know, whether they're vegetarian, vegan, or, or they're an all-meat diet, I don't know, in, in spite of whether we like Ford or Chevy, in spite of, you know, wh whether you're an Apple person or an Android person, in spite of it all, people coming together because their faith is in Christ alone for their salvation. In spite of our differences, coming together around that common faith and purpose in the world to share God's love and offer of salvation with other people. Not only does our unity have a purpose, verse 22, Jesus indicates that we are to be united in our purpose, fulfilling, that is, the ministry that Christ has given to each one of us, even willingly enduring suffering. And you notice there that he talks about, I've given to my followers, the disciples and those who would follow, I've given the glory that you gave me, Father, I've given it to them. Well, what kind of glory is Jesus talking about there? I think that's a different glory than he talks about later when he says, hey, I want them to be where I am and see me in my full glory. It's not the same kind of glory. Earlier, Jesus had asked the Father, hey, glorify your Son as I glorify you. And what he was talking about there is, I'm about to go to the cross. I'm going to die for the sins of the entire world here. I want this to be done to your glory. I want you, Father, to get the recognition for this. And I want, I want all of these events to serve your purposes including my suffering. That is the glory that Jesus has given to His church, that we too have that calling to present God's truth to the world. We may have that same calling to experience some measure of suffering because of our Christian faith, whether it's something so simple as being teased or mocked to something as serious as, as bodily harm we have been called to be united in our purpose. Unity is something that verse 23, he says, is so that the world might know not only that God sent Christ, that the Father sent the Son, but unity that the world might know that the Father loves Christ's followers. That they would be able to just tell, wow, God must really love those people. Jesus prays for unity in His church. You know, unity, unity looks good, I think. I think it's encouraging. I, I always enjoy seeing people working together toward a common goal. Everybody pulling their weight, doing even more sometimes, helping one another, working towards that common goal. We like that. Again, we like it in, in, in our, our movie heroes, you know, the, whatever it is, you're, you're, the, the Avengers or, or the Jedi and the Rebellion or the crew of the Enterprise or whatever your flavor is. We love it when those people pull together in the face of overwhelming odds and they, they work as a, a unified team to confront a, a common problem or to achieve a common goal. 
We like unity in those who protect us, unity in, in our firefighters as they seek to work to put out the flames or, or to rescue the people. We like that in our soldiers. We like that in our police officers. We appreciate unity as people come together to stand up against injustice. We like it when people work together towards good common goals. Unity is what Jesus prayed for. He prayed it for you. He prayed it for me. He prayed it for His church. So let your love for the Lord result in unity and love for the Lord's people. Let me say that again. Let your love for the Lord result in unity and love for the Lord's people. Let's strive for unity in God's church. Look to the Lord. Love His people. Jesus prayed for you. He's got your back. He's watching your six. He's in your corner. He wants you to experience the unity that can only come through a relationship with Him by faith. And He not only wants you to experience that unity with Him, He wants you to experience that unity with every other person who names Him as Savior. He loves you. Do you love Him? Let your love for the Lord result in unity and a love for the Lord's people. Let's pray. God, we thank You for Your love for us. Without it, we wouldn't be able to do any of this. We wouldn't love You. We wouldn't love Your people. We wouldn't love the world, or, or anyone enough to, to seek to share your love with them. So thank you for loving us. And God, we thank you that you have sought to pass that love on to us and through us. You have called us to love one another, to, to love others with that same love with which you have loved us. Help us to do that, God. That's a, that's a tall order, something we can't do by ourselves, but with you and empowered, equipped by your Spirit, God, we can love other people the way you call us to. Through it all, God, let us strive for unity as your church. Let us show that having the Lord in our lives makes a difference. It makes a difference in how we treat one another, how we talk to one another, the things that we do, the things we think, the things we say. Lord, let us love you, love others, and to live in unity. We thank you, God, for your gracious mercy in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's close our time with a, a final song of worship here. You know, God wants us to live in unity. He wants us to thrive under his provision and his love. So let's sing to him together. Feel free to stand with me.
hard work digging deep to know our Father's heart. Into the world we're reaching out to show them who you are. you experience that this week, that you thrive because of the Lord's love for you and your love for Him in return. Strive after that unity. Strive to love the Lord's people. Yeah, you can do that in our growth groups this week. Sign up, and uh, we're also going to have our online fellowship time this afternoon at 1 o'clock, so you'll find that link in the email from the church earlier this week. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful, wonderful week.